panel's about Asia today, so let, let's start with, um, you know, what your views on the Asia uh, electronic music landscape today. Um, Eric. Well, I can't talk reason? about Asia specifically, I can talk about China. Um, EDM in China is at an infancy at best. I would say of the 200 million or so potential demographic of uh, 15 to 25 year olds, less than 1% are accessible to uh, EDM. So it's a huge growth opportunity, but right now is a niche and uh, it's non-mainstream. And this is why part of the main things that we want to do is to bring this music genre to the mainstream and this is why we're doing a lot of this superstar collaboration so we get the genre on radio, the genre on television, etc. Well, uh, Asia's the, the untapped market of the world for EDM, I think. I mean, it's getting there and everything, but we haven't even peaked yet. And uh, I mean, shit, we, like I said before, you know, we populate more than 50% of the world. That's a lot of people. I mean, we can have our own fucking Tomorrowland and fucking, you know, it, it's, it's just an untapped market. Everyone thinks that it's going off. You look at the videos, you see all the marketing, you see all that stuff, but you ain't on the ground. You ain't in the scene. You ain't in the fucking country. How the fuck are you going to know? You know, a scale of 1 to 10, we're probably at like a fraction of 1% of where this can go. So it's uh, panels like this that's going to you know, make people more aware of the potential that uh, as long as all these guys and we all work together, which I think is going to be very important as well, um, this is going to be something great for a long time. Um, the growth of EDM in different you know, sector pockets in China, and we're going to go one by one. First of all, you know, Nightclubs in China are mostly a table service uh, type of situation, so a lot, not a lot of people stand in lines uh, at bars. So most of the clubs make their money by selling tables, and you see that trend growing. But what I've seen is that there's a lot of underground parties popping around Shanghai, Beijing, Wuhan, Chengdu, Guangzhou. So like about five to eight cities are, you know, compared to a couple of years ago, there's only one or two. So you definitely see the growth of the underground scene, and it's more of a dance culture where there's actually no tables. So I see a difference there. And um, you know, besides uh, nightclubs, I, I think there's a trend of uh, the kids out there wanting to party in warehouses, just like here. Okay, so that's that trend's been growing. So I could see physically see that the things have been changing over the last 10 years. And obviously, festivals. Besides the Storm Festival that I I, uh, I run. But uh, there are others. Uh, they're growing one or two each year in Shanghai. You know, there's a couple in Beijing already. So you can see significant, uh, significant growth in the festival market. But I have to say, uh, is it authentic or not? You know, in, in Shanghai, I probably could identify five to 10 rich kids, billionaire families who would just like to throw money around, you know, tip the scale of the market, and maybe overprice, uh, overpay DJs just so they have a festival and then they lose, they lose their ass and never do it again. We're still in the gentrifying phase where predominant events are, are, are attended by uh, the Western market or, or Americanized or Westernized Asians. Um, Arthur, you live in Indonesia, which is you know, the fifth largest population in the world, but with events like the Warehouse Project, they're predominantly all Indonesian people. So I used, I mean, I guess I'm going to ask all of you this question. I mean, are you starting to see the move in the gentrification of the electronic music scene where it's far more local driven attendees versus just strictly uh, Western folks going? I think one of the main problems that Asia in the past had, it was most of the club was only like this bottle service with um, expats like bankers was the most interesting on just hooking up with local girls rather than coming for the music. So it used to be a problem. Um, now you have way more like local talents. Like by example, in, in, in Bali, you have like some great uh, Indonesian, like DJ, like resident uh, artist. And, um, and I think for, uh, for international DJ, it's become more and more interesting to of course getting like um, a new audience and like a larger one, because as you said, like uh, Asia, it's, um, it's a really large country and it opened up like um, a proper new market. From my perspective, uh, you know, our company, we do Storm. Our, ob our objective is to grow Storm as many cities as possible in China, as fast as possible. So two this year, maybe five next year, and 10 the following years. 
Uh, obviously, doing a festival is very expensive and very risky. So unless we're prepared to lose money for the first three years, don't even try to do it. Uh, now, it comes to international brands, the ultras of the world, the EDCs of the world, any of the brands on the SFX. You know, unfortunately, I mean, in China, I wouldn't say about Asia, no one really knows them. So it's not like, you know, anyone buying the brand or licensing the brand is going to get any significant value in promotion marketing. On top of that, all the social medias, you know, that everyone knows, the Facebook, Google, I mean, the, just, you know, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Instagram, they're all banned in China. So forget about accessing your content, uh, accessing your fans or, your, uh, or any database in China. So if these brands coming into a particular market like China, there is a, in this zero uh, competitive advantage. Might as well just start your own because then you own the brand. You don't have to pay a license fee. You spend the same money as you do for international brands. And you, know, you control everything and you know how to do the marketing yourself. So, so Eddie, you know, continuing with the growth discussion, um, you know, you're moving into Macau for the first time, and obviously a very different animal than opening Pasha in New York. I mean, do you think there's, how important is it to have a local partner, and do you think that there's uh, the right infrastructure promoter-wise, government um, support-wise, sponsors, artists, you know, the clubs itself? Right, well, first I just crapped myself, because I didn't know Facebook and all those things are banned in Asia, so now I th we're screwed. <laughs> it's all we ever do in America. <laughs> Rut row. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, my philosophy used to be as inclusive as possible. You know, I'm going to a new territory, a new market. I started out in Brooklyn, in New York City, many years ago. And when I went to Manhattan, the next borough, my home city, effectively, I still knew I had to pay my dues. So I certainly know I'm going to have to pay my dues going to Macau. Um, so we're fully prepared to. Uh, work with local promoters um, and, and, you know, understanding that we'll be learning as we go there. There's good ones and bad ones, which is wonderful to be meeting these guys. Eric and I were just talking about some ideas preparing, you know, and he gave me some wonderful ideas and thoughts. So, you know, we, we, we definitely intend on being inclusive and, and, and working with everybody. Um, we understand the challenge of opening a Vegas-style nightclub in Macau. Um, you know, a lot of people have talked about it. Uh, we realize we're pioneers, so, you know, we're certainly going to embrace everybody. Let's talk about artists now. So, you know, I've been booking, I booked thousands of artists in, 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 over, over the course of the years, and I just realized that I can't even name more than 10 Asian electronic music artists. Steve Aoki doesn't count. Um, and that's quite embarrassing considering I'm based in Hong Kong. And so where are these, you know, with this growth of electronic music in Asia, where are these electronic Asian music artists? Uh, artists? Do they exist? Are they coming up? Where are they coming from? I mean, is, where's the next zoo of, of Asia or the G-Dragon of electronic music? Can, I'd like everyone to kind of chime in. Can we start with you, Jeff? I think it's a really interesting question, and the short answer is I don't know where they are. Um, and, and you're coming from a label standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've I know there's a hotbed of talent there. Um, I've worked with K-pop producers to produce um, some of my signed artists, and it's, it's been some of the most cutting-edge production that I've, ever, that I've ever had come back to me. So it's evident that the production talent is there. I've been thinking about, a lot about why, that, why there aren't more artists coming out there, and I think it's route to market. Um, I, the, understanding today the, the limitations of social media in places like China, how does an Asian artist, re an Asian artist reach the world? You know, their best route to market is through a Western label, and if there is a cultural or a language barrier that they're going to experience in getting their music in front of those people in a in a compelling way to have them back it and support it, then what are their what are their other options? It is, you know, that it's happening on a micro level for them in their own backyard. But how do they take themselves to the rest of the world? There are a lot of Asian DJs and artists. A lot of them are he's signed. Justin O, he plays at Yultra, right? I mean, Laidback Luke, he's Asian. Chucky, he's Asian. Steve Aoki is Asian. He's well, I'm talking Japanese. about Asian from Asia, not, not Americanized or from born in Europe or, or anything. You, you consider me Asian because I live in Korea, but I'm a born and raised American. Okay. So how about residing in Asia or, or born in Asia? There are plenty, like I said, in Jakarta, Indonesia. It's big, it's massive. They're so musically inclined. 
Like, um, have, have you heard of Angadimas? I mean, he's, that's not my kind of producer, but Angadimas is pretty big. Blingy Goldfish, they're pretty huge now. They're, they're signed on the Hardwell's label. I mean, they're in the top 10 B-pop charts. Not my kind of music, but still, they're there. Singapore, we have Shin. Um, he's a good techno DJ, um, producer. Um, also signed by some cool uh, labels. Um, still, I need to study China and uh, India. And India, look at Arjun. We met Arjun last year. He's, he's, he's a good producer from India. Kakox plays his tunes and stuff. Goldfish and Blink from KL. Yeah, they're doing well. They did track with Hardwell. Exactly, I just said that. So... They are, you know, we just have to really dig and understand little scenes and I'm telling you, they are, they are like good um, artists yeah, and producers. There's even an electronic band called Idiotape that's doing a world tour right now. Uh, very unknown to anybody, but they've been around for a long time. The question is, why do, not, why do we here don't know about Asian artists for the rest of the world? I mean, from the point of view of China, I mean, no one knows China, let's put it this way. Who knows Alibaba became the, the, before they became the biggest, you know, company on the internet, biggest IPO ever. Um, no one knows about them. So the question about China is that China is so, it's, you know, China is even more secluded than the Asia, every, the other guys in this panel. I mean, essentially I'm sitting in the most recluse market where no one really knows anything about because all the social medias are completely banned. No Google, no Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram, no SoundCloud. So you want to post something, no one sees it. And then uh, for Chinese artists, they, wanna, they can't even access the website, so they cannot post anything for the world to see. And this is why we started an artist management company, probably the, in fact, we're the only one in China. Our, uh, our goal is to get the artists that we see fit as their producers or DJs and their skill set, and then uh, put them through the international promotion system, the Instagrams, the, you know, the sound clouds of the world, and push them out, outward to, towards the rest of the world. But hopefully, more companies will start as EDM grow in China, and more management companies or agencies are going to open in China, open their shop in China. You know, as far as culture is concerned, how has that played? What role has that played in as a as a advantage or a hindrance to what you're doing? You know, I mean, going about the culture is that uh, you got to understand China is communist, so they wiped away the Chinese culture. The true Chinese culture is in Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. So you know, right now. <laughs> Right now, China is the communist China culture, which means pretty much there's no superstition, no religion, no, basically the God is the government. So what, what is interesting about doing business in China, at least in uh, EDM, if you want to put shows on in, uh, in clubs or festivals, it's really your relationship to the police at the end of the day. And of course, making sure the artist that you bring in is not on the blacklist. Uh, you have to go through the Ministry of Culture. And if you don't do it properly, you know, you, the promoter, the agent, the manager, plus the artist will end up in jail. You know, being in the States and doing this for a long time and kind of seeing what's happened to our scene in America, you know, I really welcome the opportunity to, you know, <clears throat> the challenge in the new market and, and, and the enthusiasm of, you know, you know, investigating and meeting new people and learning and being part of something uh, at such an early stage is really, really exciting. Um, you know, hopefully Vegas doesn't infect uh, Asia as it's infected the rest of the world with, with, with how they've done things out there. Um, and, and, and that everyone's smart and we learn from what happened in America where we, just a couple years ago, you know, we're talking about, you know, is America the next Europe? And, and it just, that was just a couple years ago and it seems like in America it's just imploded already. So I'm, I'm really hoping that, you know, we build work together to build this EDM scene on a, on a much stronger foundation and, and a responsible and, and grow it smart uh, so that, you know, we're not here three years from now talking about what's the next market. It is untapped market. There's a lot of fucking different things, but each and every culture is different. Like, you know, what you were hearing from Eric, Eric, everything that Eric's saying is 100% true. I'll, I'll back him up on that. But... In Japan, Korea, Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore, Jakarta, KL, I mean, Taipei, Hong Kong, Macau, they're all different. Every single goddamn one is different. So when you go into Asia, you're thinking, oh, it's Asia like a whole. Uh, no, nah, it's a whole fucking mixing pot of shit. And then you're going to land on one of those pieces of shit, and you're not going to know what the hell you're getting into. They're going to be peanuts. They're going to be like, you don't know what's going to happen. JC, but, just got to leave a comment for Oh, John. my sorry. My bad. 
Oh, and another thing is, music event business is supposed to be passion driven, but shouldn't be focused on money, but focus on the building of a culture. Work together instead of against each other, you dumb asses. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to thank the panel and, um, you know, I, I hope you guys had some good insights on uh, just a, an opening discussion on understanding the Asia market from a macro view and just touching some of the key points. Uh, one thing I can say that I speak for the whole panel is that we're definitely open for collaborations and we welcome, uh, you know, support to help grow the market and culture out there for electronic music. So th thank you, IMS, and thanks, guys.